Hello, this is lecture one from chapter 15 on the federal courts. So what are we going to be learning about in this lecture? Well, first, we're going to talk about the function of the judiciary in relationship to separation of powers. We're going to learn about different types of cases and laws that come to the courts. And we're going to talk about the organization of the American judiciary. So let's get started. So this topic on the federal courts uh, closes out our exploration of the institutions of government. And as we know, the federal courts or the judiciary is the third branch of government. We've learned that Congress makes decisions. That is that they create laws. We also know that the president and the executive branch executes those decisions. In other words, they implement and enforce laws. So what do courts do? Um, what is the function of courts? Well, what courts do is that they settle disputes. They settle arguments or disagreements over law, over whether somebody violated the law, whether or not the law has been properly enforced. Um, and so what the court does is that it is there to um, make sure that when people come into conflict with each other or institutions come into conflict with each other, the court is there to settle the dispute. So let's take a look at some concrete examples of dispute settling. So what are some of the types of disputes that courts settle? Well, one is a dispute over criminal law, and we'll be defining criminal law in more detail in one moment. So the dispute that comes to the court is whether or not a person is guilty of violating the law. Um, an we have laws in the book, such as, let's say, burglary, and maybe an individual will be charged with burglary, but the person charged may say they dispute that claim. They say, no, I'm innocent. I did not you know, enter into somebody's house and take their things. Uh, and, and so the court settles that, dis that dispute. It tells us whether or not that individual is guilty as charged. Uh, another dispute that can arise is over um, disputes between two people or between a person and a corporation or another entity. Uh, and that oftentimes is the kind of law that's known as civil law. And so the dispute that comes to the court is, um, is a person responsible for some sort of um, damage that they cause? Uh, let's say that you have a house and you fail to um, shovel the sidewalks and somebody uh, walks on your sidewalk and they slip and fall and they hurt themselves. Well, are you responsible for that damage? Uh, do, you, do you break a contract? Are you responsible for um, not living up to your side of the contract? And so that'll go to the court and the court will tell us who is the responsible action or the responsible party. We also have disagreements over the constitutionality of laws and the constitutionality of actions. And so a dispute will come sometimes come to the court that says, we'll ask, is a federal or a state law constitutional? Uh, we saw that in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, in the Affordable Care Act, uh, it said that, uh, that uh, uh, people had to have health insurance, and if they didn't have health insurance, they would get a penalty. Well, some wondered whether or not Congress had the constitutional right to force people to have health insurance. And the court settled that dispute, and they said yes, because um, uh, the penalty is a tax and Congress has taxing authority. Another example would be um, uh, state laws that define marriage as between a man and a woman. Uh, those, the constitutionality of those laws were challenged, and the answer was those kinds of laws are unconstitutional because they violate a person's equal protection of the law and their fundamental civil liberties. Uh, courts also settle disputes about whether or not a law is uh, constitutionally um, uh, executed if it's implemented according to uh, 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 the Constitution. And so in your, text, in your textbook, you'll read about some issues that arose during the, um, the Iraq War following the 9-11 attack. Um, and during that time, the Department of Defense had defined certain individuals as enemy combatants, and they were denied certain legal protections. Well, in one case, the Department of Just or the Department of Defense de denied somebody who was a U.S. citizen but was caught on the battlefields of of Afghanistan. Uh, that whether they were denied their habeas corpus rights, they weren't given an attorney, they weren't told why they were charged, 
Uh, and so in that case, uh, the question was, did the Department of uh, defense violate the Constitution? And the answer to that question was yes. And so the courts settle disputes that arise over criminal law, civil law, and the constitutionality of laws and actions. Your textbook talks about two types of laws and cases that work their way through the courts. And they oftentimes have um, separate court systems that they work their way through, but not always. Um, but criminal law is one type of court case and a civil law is another type of court case that works its way through the courts. A criminal law defines conduct that is not allowed, um, conduct that is prohibited. That's what criminal law does. Um, an example of that is that it, you know, basically says certain behavior, behaviors are prohibited because they're harmful. And if you engage in these behaviors, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, sexual assault, burglary, those are good examples of criminal law. Um, and that in criminal law, the dispute is always between the state and the individual. And so the state, the, the laws are state laws, or they could be federal laws as well. And so the dispute is between the state or the federal government that says, we have these laws on this, the book, and this person violated those laws. And so in a criminal case, it's always going to be, for example, something like the state of Wisconsin versus Bob Smith, the individual, or the, the United States versus Bob Smith. Um, the, in the, it, it, as your textbook says, the, the government is always the person who has the complaint. They're always the plaintiff in the case. Um, it, the standard used in criminal law is higher than in civil law. And so it's, uh, because somebody is being found guilty and the penalty that they can get when they're found guilty can range from uh, uh, probation uh, to uh, incapacitation in a prison all the way up to the death penalty, that we have a pretty high evidentiary standard when we find somebody guilty. And that evidentiary standard is known as beyond a reasonable doubt. There can't be any reasonable doubt um, in your mind if you are convicting somebody of a crime. A civil law is different. Uh, it, it settles disputes not between the state and the individual, but it settles disputes between individuals or between organizations, private organizations, or individuals versus private organizations. Um, and so uh, the, the branch of civil law is the uh, laws that deal with disputes that do not involve criminal penalties. Um, it revolves around the question about whether or not somebody is responsible for their actions. Uh, and so examples of civil law would be suing somebody for breach of contract, right? That you have a contract, you sign that contract, each party is supposed to end, hold up its end of the bargain. If one person fails to hold up their end of the bargain, such as a landlord and a tenant, tenant fails to pay rent, or a landlord fails to heat apartment, um, then the question is, is who is the responsible individual? There's no criminal penalty, rather, um, so you, if you're found to be the responsible party, you aren't sent to prison or in cap, uh, jail. Rather, you're, um, you are told that you had to make up, you need to, be, you need to pay for the damages that you have, um, that you're responsible for. Uh, and so the punishment, so to speak, is the, that you compensate the other individual for damages. The evidentiary standard is less than um, the evidentiary standard in criminal law. Since we're just trying to figure out who is responsible, the evidentiary standard that we use is by a preponderance of the evidence. And so you could see somebody like O.J. Simpson, who was found to be uh, not guilty in his criminal case, uh, but he was found to be responsible when the parents of Nicole Brown Simpson sued him for wrongful death, he was found to be the responsible party. That happens because there's different evidentiary standards that are used in criminal and civil law. So how is the judiciary in the United States organized? Well, it's a reflection of several principles. Um, it reflects the, the fact that federal law is supreme. There's this thing called the Supremacy Clause, um, Article 6, Section 2, that basically says that federal law is the supreme law of the land and it takes precedence over state law. And so when state and federal law come into conflict with each other, um, the federal law has the final say. Another feature of the United States is that, as we know from our midterm exams, uh, that we there was a question on this, 
We also know that the United States is a federal system. It is uh, powers divided between the federal government and the state governments. Um, and some powers, very important powers, are reserved to the states. And these are oftentimes known as the police powers. Uh, that is the powers to regulate conduct, behavior, morality, marriage, etc. And so a lot of um, uh, powers that are reserved to the states, and a lot of these powers have to do with criminal law. So these two principles, the principles of federal supremacy and the principles of federalism, are reflected in the way that the United States court system is organized. The principles of federal supremacy and federalism are reflected in the way that our court system is organized. Um, for one, we have separate court systems that for federal law and for state law. And so that is a reflection of federalism. And so that um, now keep in mind that the vast majority of criminal cases are, are, are state cases since the police powers are reserved to the states. The states are the ones who are doing a lot of defining of what is um, prohibited behavior. Um, and so 90, you know, five plus percent of all criminal cases work their way through the state criminal court case, courts. And also the vast majority of people are, you know, like incarcerated in, 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 in state penitentiaries, not at the federal level. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, the federal government isn't involved in criminal matters. They are. Um, but uh, that to, uh, criminal law, criminal code or federal criminal law uh, has to deal with some power granted to the federal government. And so um, copyright violation, uh, 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 counterfeiting money, um, you know, if you were to uh, kill an endangered species, if you were to engage in a crime that, that used the interstate uh, highways or roads um, to traffic people for sexual purposes or traffic drugs, um, all of those are federal criminal offenses, okay? There's also civil cases as well at the state and federal level, and that's reflected in how our court system is organized. Now, the United States Supreme Court serves as the court of last resort for mo most cases. Um, usually, the, we don't see an overlapping between state and federal courts. They do overlap, though, when state cases deal with federal matters that are in the Constitution. So, for instance, if you are tried in a uh, state court and found guilty, but you feel like a certain constitutional right has been violated, such as you were illegally searched or that you were not um, given a proper jury trial, uh, those all trigger um, the liberties, the rights that we have in our Bill of Rights. And so at that point, your case, as you appeal it, uh, would, would work its way to the federal courts. Um, and so when it's a question of constitutionality of both state, local, or federal law, it's the Supreme Court that has the last say in that matter. Um, and there's no higher authority, legal authority, beyond the Supreme Court, uh, except for another Supreme Court decision. And so once the, the Supreme Court rules, it could be overruled or overturned by a subsequent decision by the Supreme Court. It can also be overturned or overruled by an amendment to the United States Constitution as well. Um, and so, uh, but for the most, most uh, uh, practically, uh, all the Supreme Court serves is the court of last resort. This graph shows you the, uh, or the way in which the judiciary is organized in the United States. On the left-hand side, you see that it's the federal system, and the federal system is set by congressional um, law, the Judiciary, judiciary Act of 1789 and other Judiciary Acts that have followed. Um, and it basically, you know, says that the U.S. district courts uh, are the trial courts. So if you are, are charged with a federal offense or if there is a civil dispute between two people who live in different states, um, that dispute will be settled in a, a U.S. district court. It's the trial courts for the federal system. And there are 94 uh, 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 federal district courts. Uh, 
if you don't like the results of your uh, the decision in the trial court at the federal level, you can appeal it to what's known as the U.S. Court of Appeals. It's also sort of known as the circuit courts. Um, while each state has at least one federal uh, trial court in it, has one federal district court in it, Wisconsin actually has two, one in Madison and one in Milwaukee, um, that uh, the, the circuit courts are regionalized. So not each state has its own circuit, but you are in a, you, you know, you are in a different, you, you're, you're in a circuit. So we're in the sec seventh circuit court of appeals. And that, you know, deals with appeals from the district courts for states that are in the Midwest. Um, there are 12 court of appeals and a 13th one that's for the District of Columbia. And they review what happens in the trial court. And in a moment, we'll talk about what are some of the actions that appellate courts can take. On the right-hand side of the graph is the state system. Now, keep in mind that each state has its own judicial system, own state judicial system. And so, you know, we have 50 different types of, of, of state systems. Uh, if that's established by the laws of the state. But for the most part, each state has a similar setup. Uh, they will be a state trial court. They hear the court for the first time and they render some sort of decision, guilty or responsible. There's a state appellate court system where um, they review the decisions of the lower court. And each state has its own state Supreme Court. Um, and that, that's the court of last resort for state matters, okay? Uh, uh, issues dealing just with the state. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slides, that if there is a constitutional question in, at the state level, uh, that's where you can see some overlap, right? Uh, so that if you feel like at your state trial you were found guilty, but that you were not, um, that, that the evidence that they presented was a result of an illegal search, or that your um, jury was um, not a proper jury, that it was the jurors were selected in a biased manner, those violate, you know, the Fourth and the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, and so you can bring your appeal um, from your state trial court. You can bring that to the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, because it's dealing with a federal matter. Now, the Supreme Court of the United States is the court of last resort. It's there on the top, and um, if there's a, uh, if you don't like the decision in the U.S. Court of Appeals, uh, that you can, or at the state Supreme Court, if the state Supreme Court is dealing with a, a U.S. constitutional matter, you can ask the Supreme Court of the United States to review your case for a final time. Um, and you do that by, and you'll learn about this in the textbook, by um, uh, submitting what's known as a petition for the writ of certiorari. Uh, and it's basically asking the court to review your case for one last time. The vast majority of uh, uh, writs of certiorari are denied. Uh, the Supreme Court only hears about 100 cases a year on final review. You'll be watching a video that does an excellent job sort of explaining why the court de decides to uh, grant certiorari. In other words, decides to hear cases for one final appeal. So we mentioned different types of courts in the previous slide, and I just want to make sure that we go over this so that we're all sort of on the same page. Uh, trial courts are what are known as the court of original jurisdiction. They hear the court, they hear the, uh, the it's the first court to hear a case, and they you have both trial courts for both civil and criminal matters. It's here where evidence is protected. Uh, presented. You might hear testimony from witnesses. There's sometimes a jury, but not always. Sometimes a judge will render a verdict. And, and so it, it's in the trial where you get some sort of verdict or decision, either guilty or responsible. Um, an appellate court, it like it says, it's, it heal, hears appeals. Okay. So if you don't like what happened in your trial court, you don't like the outcome of the trial court, then you can ask the appellate court to review your case. Now, if you are found to be not guilty or not responsible, the, um, well, let me back up. If you're found to be not guilty, okay, then the, the, the state can't appeal your acquittal, okay? Once you're acquitted, then you are free to go and the state can't um, ask the appellate court to review the decision. 
you can do that in a civil case, right? If you have uh, two people and one is found responsible, the other's not res found responsible, you know, then there, there can be a, a, an appeal at that level, but not for criminal cases, not when it's state versus the individual. The appell appellate court's different. Um, they hear appeals of the trial court decisions, um, but they don't have, there's not a jury, uh, there's not usually testimony that's made in the court um, that uh, uh, that usually the that what the court does is that each side of the case so like in a criminal case if a defendant is appealing the decision the defendant's uh, the lawyer will submit briefs the state will submit briefs basically arguing for why the uh they should throw out the ruling of the lower court uh the other side saying no don't throw out the ruling of the lower court uh and then you know a bank of three justices uh sometimes usually sometimes more will make a decision about whether to affirm the decision of the lower court uh whether to uh vacate the decision of the lower court in other words throw it out or in a criminal matter, they might say that they will uh, send the case back for a retrial, okay? Or and they can do that in civil cases as well, kind of send it back to the lower court to reconsider the case, okay? And so appellate courts, a big takeaway is, is they don't have a jury. Uh, there aren't, you know, there isn't testimony and evidence that's presented. Rather, it's a review of what took place at the lower level. And Supreme Courts are the highest courts in the system. And they are usually, they usually serve an appellate function. Supreme Court has the right to hear some cases for the very first time, to some uh, original jurisdiction, but for the most part, it is an appellate function.